Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now, I got a question just before I read to you. You know, I always say, if I had a time machine, who would go back with me? Who would like to, just for this day, step in for Ananias? You get to do his role in the play. So you go, I'm going to be Ananias for the day. So, So the Lord says to Ananias, get up. Go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And so it says, He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias that comes in and lays hand on him that he might regain his sight. So Ananias answered, Lord, I've, I've heard about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has here the authority... T- from chief priests to bind all that call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and before kings and before the sons of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now Ananias, when the Lord said, Here I, you call my name, Lord? Here I am. The Lord says, I got an assignment for you. And Ananias is like, okay. He says, you're going to go and lay hands on this, this man named Saul and that he can regain his sight. What was Ananias' response to this? I don't think this is a good idea, Lord. Don't you know this is the guy that persecuted those that belong to your way? And this is the guy that, that you know, he has authority to arrest us and take us, you know, into prison and... You want me to go to him? <laughs> Lord, this is, we should run from that guy, right? This is, anyone think this would be a good idea in the natural mind to not go pray for Saul? I, I do. I think I'd be like, I'm not sure I want to do Ananias' job. But listen to the words of the Lord. The Lord said, I have chosen him as an instrument of mine. You think God has chosen a persecutor of the church? as an instrument that he's going to use. I mean, this is not how I would pick teams. If I was picking teams, I'd pick guys that were zealous that for the right. Not the guys that are zealous against the right. I mean, he was, he was against the way of the Lord. He was full out persecuting the church. And, and just to show you, Jesus takes quite offense. This is why I joke and say Jesus is a little bit Sicilian. Because... He says, Saul, Saul. Remember when he blinded him? I, I call this the spiritual gib slap. <laughs> you know, he goes blind and he says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth my church? Is that what he said? No, he said, why dost thou persecuteth me? Now, Jesus had already died and rose. He was in heaven. Who was Saul persecuting? The followers of Jesus, the Christian, the way. He was was going after the Christians and persecuting them. And this is why I say he's part Sicilian, because Jesus said, why dost thou persecute me? You're picking on my family. You're picking on my followers. This is a Sicilian thing, but if you pick on someone in my family, guess who you just picked the fight with? And I mean, and and (laughs) Saturday someone's over at our house to go, Pastor, you, you like watching UFC? You're like weird, you know, like they're not supposed to do that. You know, David was a fighter, right? In the Bible, King David, and there was a few guys that fought in the scriptures, you know, kind of the heroes of the faith. My middle name's David, by the way, so I can use that as a cop out. But I am wired for fight, and don't talk, do not pick on my family. I mean, you should not do that. I learned from Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. You pick on his church. He says you picked on him. You pick on my family, you picked on me. See, I I love my family. Jesus said, I love my wife, like Christ loves the church. I'm just modeling for you how to do this, guys. You should always stand up for your family, men. Always. If someone says you shouldn't do it, they're wrong. 
Uh, they are wrong. That it's okay to stand up for you. Jesus stood up for his church. How does that make you feel thinking Jesus would stand up for you? It's good, huh? It's awesome. And, you know, Jesus stood up for the church when Saul, this mighty persecutor of the church, was causing so much distress. And I'm going to show you just, I'm going to read a little further in Acts here, just to show you how much distress this one irritant cost to the church. I mean, this guy, his influence against Christianity was so mighty that when he, when he gets converted by the Lord, it's going to take a little while to everyone believes that he's converted. But once they finally accept he is converted, it says the church will enjoy great peace for a season because the biggest irritant, the biggest persecutor got converted. See, but when we have big enemies come against us, we don't think, hey, why don't we pray for, like, um, like Saul to Paul. But, uh, see, the Lord's going to tell him, you know, Saul, get up. Now, this is interesting. Ananias goes to him in verse 17. He obeys the Lord, even though the Lord said, you know, he's like, I don't think it's a good idea. And the Lord said, don't worry. He's a chosen instrument of mine. And he's going to go in verse 15 to bear my name before the Gentiles, and before kings, and before the sons of Israel. He's going to be used mightily. But I, he says, will show him how much he will suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed, he entered the house, and after laying hands on him, he said to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me that you might regain your sight. And that you might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized and he took food and was strengthened. Remember, he didn't eat for three days, three nights. He did not eat food or drink. He is sitting there fasting and he's blind. Now, do, what do you think was going on? I submit to you he's having intense seminary experience with Jesus. Because Jesus what told Ananias what he was telling Saul. He said, don't worry, I'm telling him how much he's going to what? Suffer. You cause suffering, Saul, you're going to suffer. Did Saul suffer, by the way? Did Paul the Apostle go through any beatings or imprisonments or shipwrecks or... Yeah, just a few. Five times he received 39 lashes from the Jews. 40 save one. 40, when they said 40 save, pull back one, that means they beat you within one stripe of death. The Romans were so good at, at torture with, 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 the, with the flogging that they could beat a man within one, one more whip and that would kill him. And, and to just make him suffer... They'd whip him so severely and with it, pull back that one, 40 save one, 39 lashes. Paul says, I received that five times. Five times. He was stoned to death. They, they, they drove him to the, 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 the spot. They stoned him with rocks till he dropped dead. They threw him over the city wall into the rubbish heap. Like, you know, they didn't even give him a burial. They just literally pitched him over the wall into the trash heap. And you know what the Lord did? Get up, Saul. You're not done. <laughs> Brought him back to life. And he went on and continued to preach. I mean, so this guy suffered. But see, when, when, Christians, when Christians are introduced to their faith, um, I don't know why, but in American Christianity, we don't, we don't always introduce what I call with a realistic introduction. They're like, oh, come to Jesus. Everything will be wonderful. Your life will be so glorious. You won't have any problems. It's a bed of roses without thorns. And I'm like, who's blowing smoke here? This is not the gospel I read. Every guy that's come to the Lord in the scriptures, they suffer for their faith. Every Christian I know, I talk to them about their testimony, and you, and you hear how things go. You know, some of their family members reject them all of a sudden. Some of their, some of their co-workers, their boss, you know, fires them, and they go through all this struggle because they just stand up for what's right. I, I, when people come to faith, I'd say, welcome to the roller coaster ride. 
And let me tell you, it's not going to be all easy. It doesn't mean it's not worth it. It just means it ain't going to be easy. I mean, the Lord told Saul what he was going to suffer. And I know the name it and claim it guys today would say, oh, don't talk about suffering. That's a distasteful subject. Why? Jesus told Saul everything he was going to suffer before he even started. I think it's just realistic. If, you, if you're coming to faith and you tell someone, hey, look, you're going to have to go through some sufferings. But our Lord suffered for us. And the Bible says, keep your eyes fixed on him the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And even, even when you grow weary and faint, he says, consider the suffering that he went through. Just to give you a little, you know, boost to keep going through your suffering. Sometimes we suffer. But listen to this. The very next verse tells me, Oh, well, actually, part of verse 19 says he rose, he took food, he was strengthened, and now for several days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately, immediately, this guy who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, very learned in the scripture, but very against Jesus, what's he begin to do? He begins to preach Jesus in the synagogues teaching that he is indeed the Son of God. And all those that were hearing him continued in amazement. And they were saying, is this not the guy who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for, for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But it says, but Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. And when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night. They let him down through an opening in the wall and lowered him in a large basket. And when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples there, but they were afraid of him. And they didn't believe he was one of the disciples. But Barnabas took hold of him, brought him to the apostles, and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that, that the Lord had talked to him. And how in Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was, he was with them then, moving freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews. That's the Greek Jews. And he was attempting to put, the, they, but they, it says, were attempting to put him to death. The guy's been a Christian all of a day or two. And guys are trying to kill him for his faith. Now, honestly, in American Christianity, we have very little of this, where you come to Christ and then all of a sudden you're threatened at the very giving of your life for your faith. But in some places in the world, if you come to Jesus today, you'll literally, if they find out, you even have one page of the scriptures, they'll kill you. You choose to follow Jesus and have everlasting life at the, at the possibility of losing your life here. This guy comes to the Lord. He went from persecuting the church to where, guess what? You're part of the group now. And guess what? They really hate you. They're going to kill you first. Get in line. You know, you, you went from killing everyone. They just like push him to the front of the line. Kill him first, you know. Like literally. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't the Christians pushing him to the front. It was the persecutors of the faith that said, that guy used to be one of us and traitor. Just think about this. He went from being in the club that was persecuting to I'm not in the club. It'd be like someone, you know, think about this. You're in a club that's really tight and then you jump ship. I mean, the examples that come to mind, I don't know if I should use How about the Hells Angels? Since I, you know, when I was growing up, that was a big deal. If you, were, if you got initiated in, there was a saying that once you were in, you never went out. If you tried to go out, what would happen? They'd kill you. It was like you don't get to get out of this group. He was in the persecuting group. He's in the bad, tough guys persecuting this new movement that was following this Jesus as the Messiah. And now all of a sudden he says, guys, I changed my mind. I'm going to serve him. I found that he really is the Messiah. And they went, we're going to kill you now. 
First he has to flee from Damascus. Then he has, li I didn't read it yet, but let me just show you. Then it says, he, he, he continues on, poor Paul. He says, a a and he, it says, when the brethren learned of it, they <laughs> that the, the Hellenistic Jews were trying to put him to death, they took him down to Caesarea. And then they sent him away to Tarsus. Now that's where Saul's hometown is, Saul Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it continued to increase. Isn't this interesting? He, the, the church has peace when the persecutor gets converted. Now I only su su suggest this as an idea because... In your life's journey, how many of you think we're going to run into someone who is violently opposed to your existence? <laughs> if you haven't had it happen yet, you are so fortunate. I don't know why, but in the course of this life, there's always one of those jerks out there that likes to ruin your day. It could be a boss, colleague at work. It could be a neighbor, a next-door neighbor. All of a sudden, they get a wild hair. I'm going to sue you. I had, I had our neighbor want to sue us because the man said he w they came from Alaska and he liked my banana, my apple bananas that I had, little short Chinese banana trees. And he wanted to get some of the keikis, the little baby plants that come off the side and put them in his yard. And so while they, they would be gone for like nine months of the year and then they come back, I guess it was real bad over there, they come over here. And while he was gone, I planted five little matching keikis where he said he wanted them in his, his wall is right on my edge of my property. So I put him in his garden right there. He came back, he was so happy. He was smiling at me. Oh, thank you so much. And the little trees had, you know, I kept watering them. So they had grown up like from little ones to about this high. And just a little bit farther, then they start giving the bananas because they only grow, they're dwarf. They only go up a, a, a little like this tall. So, so I'm like, yay, you know, and he's all happy. And then I get a letter in the mail. And it's from, his, it's from an attorney. And it's, we're going to sue you for putting banana trees on our property. And it was from his wife. Yeah. And I was like, Ugh. they've moved away and, you know, hopefully <laughs> God be with them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was like, y if that day was bad. It made my wife really uncomfortable. And I, I just went and, so she, maybe she's having a bad day. Maybe it's a bad hormone roller coaster of life, time of life, you know. Be, I've been a pastor a while. I know things can happen. I don't know how this could happen, that the husband would be so happy I put the plants in, and she's saying, I'm going to sue you because this isn't the vision I had for that garden. Okay, they're banana trees. It's like, they're like grass. Pluck it out, you know. I mean, But no, you get them out of there or I'm going to sue you. And I remember having to take out the trees, and one had already put a little bit of a flower out and was put in fruit. And the neighbors that had seen me put them there, make it all, keep it all weeded for them the whole time they'd been gone for nine months. They're like, "What? They're like just about to give bananas. What's wrong with these people? You know?" And the husband seems to want them, but the wife does not want them. And she went and hired an attorney, and it's making my wife really nervous at night. She cannot sleep. And you go from having peaceful life to just one. Why is it just one of these people can make your day go so bad? You know what I'm talking about? There's one person that can just really turn your day horrible. They sour it with one act, one deed. Well, Saul was that guy to the whole church. And I just want to wrap this up by pointing out the very guy who God used so mightily for his work, the one he used to plant so many churches, the one he used to write such a great portion of the New Testament, was a former persecutor of the faith. And I submit to you, he wouldn't have been my pick. But the Lord had a little chat with him. He said, Saul, you're too full of yourself. And we're not going to call you Saul anymore. We're going to call you Paul. Those of you who know the Hebrew Paul, even though it's only one letter difference in Saul, it's a big difference in meaning. Handsome, desirable Saul to Paul, which means little. Little one. 
Hey, little one. Too full of yourself. We'll just call you little one. Hey, little. And Saul says the Lord changed his name. No longer are you going to be called Saul. You're called Paul. Just like he did with Peter. Remember Peter, Simon, shifting sand. No longer are you going to be si Simon, shifting sand. We're going to call you Cephas Rock, Petro. You're going to be a, a, a stone. You know, the Lord doesn't mind renaming guys to, to, to what he's going to work and accomplish in their lives. And he, re he renamed Saul to Paul. And this is good for some of the new believers. They didn't know that. They're, they're going, I, it, it keeps switching. I don't know. Is, it, is, is Saul a different guy than Paul? You know, is it two guys in the... In, no, it's the same guy. It's just who's telling the story at that point. He was Saul while he persecuted the church. And then you're going to see his name will start to be referred to as Paul after the Lord does a work in humbling him and getting him ready to be used. Now, if only I would listen to Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew 6. We'll end with this verse. The words of our Lord... Jesus said in verse 43 of Matthew 6, You have heard it said that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus says this, verse 44, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that what? Persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Guys, on this Father's Day, we have one Father who is in heaven, our Heavenly Father. And if you want to be one of His kids, he's, He says, you need to do this. You love your enemies and you pray for those that persecute you. Now some of you go, but I'm not going to pray for them. They're a jerk. They, su they, they sent me a letter to sue me. That's how mean they were. Or they did this other, they, they were horrible. They fired me. They did. Listen. Pray for them. Pray for them. And if you don't know what to pray, here's what I submit to you to do. Because I'm cheating a little. I'm, I'm using the material from today's sermon. If they're like really persecuting you and they're really a pain and they're an irritant in your life, like Saul was to the church, how about you do this prayer? We'll just call it the prayer of Saul to Paul. God, get them from being such a jerk and persecuting and make them a, from persecutor to preacher. Yeah, that's it. Let's fix their wagon from going against the things of the Lord to now they got to work for the Lord. That's a, that's a soul to Paul prayer. Okay, that jerk, he really needs prayer. Lord, convert him. But don't just convert him. No, no, we don't just want him to come and sit in the back of the church and be an irritant to everyone else. We want a radical Saul to Paul conversion where he goes from being that irritant to being that one instrument that God uses my... What, what, how good would this be if we prayed this for all our enemies? Or how about the enemies of our country? You know, that are literally coming, want to bomb us out of existence. If you don't think they're out there, you need to just like maybe travel the world a little. Go over to the Middle East, find out Americans are not loved everywhere. You know, we are hated in some countries. I mean hated. Infidels. They would like to scour us from the face of the earth. And that's enemies to me. Now, my Sicilian side would pray for them, but not the same prayer. And not a good prayer. And I realized that I needed to grow when I studied this passage, that God took the very persecutor, the worst one, and put him on his team. And didn't just put him on the team as like in the back of the lineup in the dugout. Maybe you get to go a pinch hit once in a while. No, he put him up to bat. He put him as the star player on the team. What if we prayed that for all of our enemies of our countries? You know, all those guys are radical is Islamists that want to blow us up and, and bomb us. Lord, convert them and save them. Make them proclaimers of your faith. Turn them to Jesus. I mean, if they're that zealous for the wrong, guys, do you understand? God doesn't mind zealous for wrong. It's just, need, it's misdirected zeal. We just need to redirect. And when you're God, can God redirect zeal? Yes. Guys, sometimes I think the church has gone to sleep so much. They're just like snoozing. 
We're waiting for Jesus to come back. <sighs> Taking a nap. We're not supposed to be napping. The Lord's coming. We should be like, look, Jesus said, look up. The fields are hot, white for harvest. There's so many souls. How many of you know somebody who doesn't know Jesus that you know you want to come to the Lord? Maybe you have a friend or a family member or a neighbor. And you're going, man, Lord, get them, please. Get them. Get them into your kingdom. You, 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 does any of you ever think, what if the Lord came for the church right now and they didn't get saved yet? What would happen for them? They're left behind. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, Left Behind. That would be a bad scenario. I want them to get saved. But, you know, the church has kind of gotten complacent. It's not really a big deal. Jesus, yeah, we know he's coming. It'll be sometime. Do I really have to live like every day he might come? Yes! Wake up! We do. We have to live every day like he could come right now. I've always joked it would be great if he'd you know, like kind of punctuate my sermon by the end with, you know, a big trump in the sky blowing and, and the sky parting right over there. We got clouds. It would work. It says his coming will be in the clouds. Can you just picture in your mind the clouds part? Angel of the Lord blowing that trump and, and all of a sudden we're, the Lord appears and says, okay, you guys, come on. Let's go. Poof. Now my son Daniel's like, Dad, I hope it happens on a Sunday. We don't have to put away all the chairs and the tents. <laughs> And pack the trailer. It'll be a great day. But just leave it behind. I mean, everyone will be going, what happened to that church? That'd be pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Like, and for me, I, I love to end on a sermon where I'm telling you, we don't know when the Lord could come, but we need to be ready at any moment because it could be any minute. And it would be great if he came now. And, and then he comes and for the rest of the eternity, be going, I told you. I told you. Didn't I, didn't I, didn't I tell you? Yeah, great. You're going to wait till we're all packed up, and then he comes. Listen, I don't care when he comes. Let's be ready. And while you're at it, don't let an enemy ruin your day. Do the Saul to Paul prayer. Start praying for your enemy. Pray, Lord, convert them. Convert them. All you got to do is touch them, change them, and put them on your team. Make them a star. Can, and you know what's funny? Some of you are going to start thinking about this. Can you imagine my auntie who is so against the Lord? Could you picture her being like like right in the front telling everybody? I mean, you're just going to start getting grins on your face when you start thinking about this because you'll be like, that jerk used for the Lord? I mean, it, it, it'll take your mind maybe a little while to wrap around it. But, but think about it. Did it happen in the scripture? to the biggest persecutor of the faith, then what's the problem with your family member? Some of you are like, you don't know my family member. I know this guy Saul was pretty zealous. I mean, to leave his hometown, to get marching orders, to go and arrest people, beat them, imprison them, put them to death. He, he was the one, do you remember when they, when they martyred, the very first martyr in the church? Who, Stephen, who did they lay their robes at the feet of? Who was holding the, the cloaks while they were stoning in him? That St Stephen. Saul. This guy was in on the killing of Christians from the beginning. From the first martyr of the faith. That was his intro. And God goes, yeah, he's been at it a while. Yeah, he's a bad guy. I'm picking him. And Saul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, when guys get picked on a team that know we were no good, but God is very good. We can teach you about grace. The man who led me and discipled me in the Lord so mightily was a man very strong about the grace of God. He always pointed out how the grace of God would change lives. And he used to teach me, he'd say, you know, if you want grace to work in another person's life, he says, you've got to leave space for that grace to work. You can't pigeonhole that person and say, well, they were always, they were the one persecuting. What? That's what Ananias wanted to do with, with Saul. But Lord, he's your per persecutor. I don't think I should go pray for him. Lord goes, I got it covered. Go pray. He needs his sight back. They get to Jerusalem. Oh, we heard about him. And Barnabas has to go and get him and say, guys, look, it's, don't pigeonhole him. Give space for grace. This guy is in the club now. I don't know. Are you sure? Yep, listen to his testimony. 
you know. But what if our reaction is when somebody's against us, we don't want to give space for grace to work in their lives. We want, you get saved and go to another church. I know some of you. You go, I'll do so to Paul, but send him somewhere else. Don't send him to my home church. Don't send him to my house after. But what if that's what God wants to do? Because he wants to use you as the model of a person filled with grace to show them, to demonstrate this is how we live grace. Grace is a beautiful thing, guys. And Paul was a great example of the grace of God. Now, we're going to go and continue on now, next week, with the resurrection. The whole principle of the resurrection. Paul's going to go into great detail about how the resurrection works. How is the, you know, like, some of the basic questions. People are like, hey, in the resurrection, do we have bodies? Is that a legit question? You know, are we going to have a body? Are we going to just be a spirit? How's it going to work? And Paul's going to answer all that coming up. Because the church, had, I believe they had the same questions. They wrote to him, asked him questions. He's like, okay, I can answer that. He knew the scripture, so he gives some of the best answers. So next week, we'll go over that. If you ever wondered about that, come on out for the study. You'll, you'll enjoy it next week as we continue. And if you have a chance, read ahead. Just read the rest of this chapter, chapter 15 in, in Corinthians, so you'll be able to you know, feel like you can soak up as much as you can when we come together. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for your word. Thanks for the privilege that I get to share it, Lord. I know it's but by, the, by your grace I am what I am. And I thank you for this man, Saul, that you called to be Paul, a vessel that you would use, Lord. I pray for all of us, Lord. We would see your hand in our lives that we are but what we are by your grace. Help us to be people that are filled with your grace, that speak with your grace, Lord, that fills our lives in our actions and our deeds towards others. As we go from here today, Lord, use us mightily. And if you don't mind, Lord, I wouldn't mind if you want to blow the trump and send your son for us. We don't have to put away the things. We'd be glad to, to just go home to be with you. But if we tarry, Lord, let us be a bright light for you until you do come. Help us be ready for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. And everyone that agree with me said... Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.